<laughs> What's going on, everybody? You know, the Nationals coming. We keep hearing about it over and over and over. And I think it's just because a lot of us are excited. It's, it's like, you know, the friend's birthday party that's coming up that's like at the awesome water slide park. And it's coming and, and, and we're just giddy. We just, we can't wait to get together. We can't wait for all the fun. And so we're all going to continue to talk about it. And even if you're not attending, and I haven't attended for the last several years, as many of you know, because Lucy, uh, my youngest daughter, has had a soccer tournament, a big regional soccer tournament down in San Diego during the national for the last several years. So I haven't attended, uh, but I will be there this year because her soccer tournament is now the weekend before. So I'm especially excited, but even if you're not attending, it, it's really fun to see all the footage and see all the pickups and see all the stuff that's on display. So don't feel like just because maybe you are not attending this year that it's not going to be a really fun week. It will. I look forward to this week every year uh, for watching all of the YouTube content that comes out. So something to think about with that. Now, we're going to talk about last week's question and last week's question that I asked to all of you, and again, whenever I ask a question to all of you, I'm genuinely interested in hearing uh, your responses. I'm not just asking a question to be asking a question. I want to know what people are doing, what people are collecting, what people are thinking, and it, it helps to keep an idea of what's happening out there in the market, what's happening out there with uh, the industry, and Oh, selfishly, when you guys share things, it, it helps me to get a better idea of whether or not it's something that maybe uh, I should be interested in. So I think that's why a lot of us tune in is because we want to hear what other people are doing because they might share something that we weren't previously aware of. But before we get into your responses for this week, I wanted to show off something that was uh, a really awesome new addition. Now, I've talked about this before. I showed this off once before, um, and this is something that I picked up at the Strongsville show. So to those of you that didn't see that video, or maybe you did, just as a quick refresher, um, Tops did an auction, the Guernsey's auction in New York City uh, in 1989. And what they did is they sold a ton of their original artwork out of you know all of their storage they basically were cleaning out their storage and selling off a lot of the artwork and one of the things that was sold uh well a lot of them were sold at this auction were the cartoon art on the back of baseball cards remember back in the 60s and 70s especially and even some before and after but there were the cartoons on the back of the cards well, a lot of that original cartoon art was sold at this auction. Now, you know, we talk about one of ones. We talk about a card is a one of one uh, when, you know, uh, fanat Fanatics, Tops, you know, Panini stamps a little one of one up in the corner on the card, and that makes it super valuable. Even though it looks just like a bunch of other cards, it might have a, just a different color. But... This is a real one of one. Like this is a true one of one. The original artwork of something that was reproduced is an incredible piece of art. Now, this is not something that I picked up at the show because I purchased it. Uh, remember, if you watched that uh, episode, I, I got this at the show because it was given to me as a gift. Now, I've received many gifts from many people over the years, and there are a few that could compare with a gift like this. Now, the, the interesting thing, and the thing that makes it super special, is it wasn't just an incredible gift to receive this one-of-one -one artwork, but this one-of-one -one artwork has a Greg Nettles uh, cartoon art on it. So the 1973 Tops issue, on the backs of all the cards were cartoons like in many of the years. And this particular year, the Greg Nettles cartoon art talks about how 
reporters commonly misspell Greg's name, which is spelled G-R-A-I-G, which is how I spell my name. And so it was super cool. Uh, I remember having this card and seeing this card and going, oh yeah, I have that problem too. People always misspell my name seeing that on the back of the card. Now, it's also more special because it's the first card of Greg Nettles in a Yankee uniform. So we have cartoon art, the original cartoon art sheet, which we'll talk more about here in a second, of the first card where Greg Nettles is in a Yankee uniform as a Yankee fan, where it talks about his name being misspelled by reporters, something I've dealt with my whole life, except not by reporters. <laughs> and it was given to me, the, the original sheet. Now, the, the thing about a lot of these cartoons is as they were purchased at these auctions, what a lot of people did to maximize their profits is they cut them up. Because a lot of them came on sheets of eight or nine to up to like 15 of the cartoons were done on one sheet. Well, what people would do is they would cut them into individual uh, sections and then sell the individual sections to maximize their profit. So it's, it's harder, it's, it's obviously very difficult to find these at all, but to find one that is a full sheet, that is the premium, that is the premier item, is the one that is a full sheet. So the one that was gifted to me was a full sheet um, that had Greg Nettles on it in the first card that he was on the New York Yankees where it talks about his name being misspelled. And, you know, I was just over the moon about the generosity of this gift. So I, I wanted to have it custom framed. So I ended, I ended up going into a framer and I got it framed and I just got it back. And I want to show it to you. Well, here's where things get even more interesting. Um, when I got home and I was showing this off to um, like family, my, my wife, my kids, and, and my parents, my mom looks and she goes, because at the, at the Strongsville show, I then went and bought all of the cards. I bought each of the 1973 Tops cards of all of the players with the cartoon art on it. And, and my mom is looking at the cards and she goes, oh, I know this guy. And I'm like, what? And we're not talking about Greg Nettles. We're talking about Rick Arbach. And I'm looking down at it. And I'll show you here in just a second. Rick Arbach grew up in Woodland Hills, California, which is um, down in Southern California, up near the valley. Um, kind of not super far from Malibu, not super far from... And Northridge, and she went to high school with the guy. So there are, on the sheet that I'm about to show you, there are 10 cartoons. One of them is the Greg Nettles, and one of them, my mom went to high school with the guy at Taft High School in Woodland Hills, California. An unbelievable gift, and just the, the layers of, of connections is awesome. So I want to show you what it looks like in the custom frame that I got done. Now, how awesome is that? Now I'll put a better picture on your screen here so you can take a look at it. I'm so excited to have this as a central showpiece in the collection. An awesome gift. Uh, just, just, I feel super blessed to have it. You know, uh, several of these sheets were on display in the Hall of Fame a few years ago. Um, then in the Hall of Fame's magazine that they send out, uh, they did an article on the collection that was shared. Um, they're really cool items. They're really rare items. And they're the real one of ones. Now, is this something or the type of thing that other people would be interested in collecting? You know, some people love this stuff and some people, they're more into just the cards. But as you are collecting, you're, the, the path in which your collection takes could turn at any moment. 
And again, that's one of the reasons I love having discussions and sharing opinions on my channel is because it allows people to hear what other people think and expose you to other things that might be of interest. Maybe you weren't even aware that the original cartoon art was out there in circulation. And maybe now after seeing it, you're like, I think I want one of those. It's now on your radar. You now know it exists. You now know it's something uh, that could potentially be found. And, and that's really this question for this week is how has your collecting changed over the last year or so? Has it gone in a different direction? Has what you collected changed? Has the, the type of grading company that you use or not use changed? Have the players changed? What has changed in your collection and why has it changed? So let's go ahead and take a look at the first couple of responses here. My hobby preferences have really changed. I got back into the hobby a year ago. I was focusing on the 1950s and 60s cards that I dreamt of when I was a teenager in the 80s. Then I started watching card collecting community YouTube videos. I enjoyed yours, but also saw Dave Blue Jacket 66, Orlando's Collector's Dream, and Mangini's channel. I went down some rabbit holes I didn't know as much about. I always had a love for baseball history, so the pre-war stuff seemed to really appeal to me. It was a new and fresh thing. There are so many different twists and turns in that section of the hobby. There are oddball cards of Cobb, Ruth, Gehrig, Matthewson, etc. I knew by memory every Mantle, Aaron, and Mays card, but these seemed to be uncharted territory for me. It also enticed me to read books concerning the deadball era. It has been extremely enjoyable on many different levels. Another comment says, Another great topic, Greg. I enjoy the community's thoughts. I think the thing for me that has changed the most is twofold. One is the evolution you touched on in this video. I find myself looking more at pre-war cards. It's the natural evolution of collectors, I think. We pick up a few modern cards here and there, but then the focus for a lot of us keeps on going back further and further as it has for me. The other big change for me has been the platforms I shop on. I was big on eBay auctions for a long time because I thought I could find value, and that has changed as my taste has. Now I look more to REA auctions and Com C to a lesser extent. I hope you are soaking up summer, and thanks for the question and content. Okay, this is a topic... This is an item that I can't resist talking about because it's something I hear all the time. Last weekend, well, the weekend before last, you know, eight or nine days ago, I was at a card show talking to a dealer friend and he said, yeah, I'm really worried about a lot of cards from the 1950s because if you go to a card show and you look at the guys looking at those tables, they're all old guys and those guys are all going to die soon. <laughs> well, don't tell them that, but this is what he's saying. And he goes, and when they do, nobody's going to want that stuff anymore. And the prices are going to crash. You know, I've heard that comment many times. If you ask any modern collector, why do you collect modern? They go, nobody cares about those old guys. They want to collect the players that they're seeing on TV. And I get that. It is fun to have a few cards of players that are still playing and then you kind of root for them because if they do well, then it could help the card values. I, I, I understand that appeal. Let me ask everybody out there listening, everybody, when you were eight, nine, ten years old, did you collect vintage cards or did you open packs and collect the cards of the players you saw on TV. See, I started with collecting in 1987, and I opened packs, and I opened packs in 88, in 89, in 90, in 91, in 92, in 93. And then as I got a little bit older, I started to be more interested in some of the history of cards. And so I started looking at some of the 
all-time greats that were winding down their career. So in the mid-90s, I started buying cards of players from the 70s. I was buying George Bretts. I was buying Andre Dawson's. I was buying, you know, Larry Bird rookie cards. I was buying uh, Joe Montana cards and Ronnie Lott and Jerry Rice. And I started to go backwards. And then before I knew it, I bought my first vintage card, true vintage card in my opinion. And that was a 1961 Topps Eddie Matthews. And I had that 1961 Topps Eddie Matthews, but I didn't pick it up until I was well into my teens. And I mean, at this point, I'm probably like 16 years old. So as I got older, the appeal of the modern stuff started to wear off and I started to go to older stuff. So then I was looking at cards in the 60s. And then soon enough, I was looking at cards in the late 50s, the 58s and the 59s and the 57s. And then, you know, three, four, five years ago, I was looking at cards in the early 50s, the 51 Bowmans, the, you know, 52 Tops, the 53 Tops, some of these awesome sets. And now I'm finding myself most drawn to some of the pre-war cards. I think that as it's mentioned here, that the kind of common evolution is to go older and older and older and rarer and rarer and rarer because it's fun to hunt and it's fun to learn. Learning about those players, learning about those times, learning about those sets, that to me is one of the most fun things to do on YouTube. You, you, you know, If I ask 10 people, what are some of your favorite YouTube channels? Many of them are the ones that teach about these older sets and older releases and older players because they're able to learn about them. If we started to talk about the 1960 and 61 and 62 set, most people in the vintage community are fairly familiar with those sets and those players and those cards and can envision what they look like. And they kind of have that skill set established to a large respect but as you start to see new things and to us now the new stuff is not the shiny refractor the new stuff is the 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 card that sammy thunder just picked up at a private sale to add to his willie mays collection that we didn't even know existed until he's showing it to us and we're learning about it so to everybody out there that says those pre-war players, those 50s players, you know, are, are going to be forgotten and nobody's going to care about them. I will continue to ask the question, who started collecting as a kid as collecting cards from 50 years prior? And who of us that collect as a kid are collecting cards 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years prior. So I think that it's, it's safe to assume that a lot of the kids that are into collecting, that are collecting the modern players now, like we did when we were kids, will eventually, many of them will splinter off into the older cards that are not uh, manufactured to be rare but are actually rare because they are old and have been largely destroyed. Just like that cartoon art. Many of those were destroyed. Many of those got lost. Some of them are still in circulation. Some of them have been cut up into multiple pieces. So the ones that are intact and are still full sheets are pretty incredible pieces. And people say, Greg, Low-grade vintage isn't that rare. I would say low-grade vintage from 1964 isn't that rare. I would tend to agree. But low-grade vintage from uh, 1909, from 1888, from 1933, I think actually is still pretty rare. And if you don't believe me, you could check out the pop reports for yourself. So when you say low-grade vintage is plentiful, 
Uh, it depends on what we're talking about because not all low grade vintage is plentiful. And that is part of the reason I think it will continue to hold value. And the other part is I think people are gonna get bored with modern and they're gonna go toward the stability and the history of the vintage cards like pretty much all of us have done. Boy, do I love this week's question. My biggest change has actually been a recent one. I have been, and probably always will be, a football collector above all else. Vintage football makes up the bulk of my collection, and I absolutely love the cards I own. That said, as I have gotten to a point where the only real big vintage football cards I want that I don't own are super expensive pre-war cards. The 1935 Chickle Nagurski and the 1888 Goodwin Champions Harry Beecher, to name a couple. I found myself looking for another affordable way to pick up some vintage cards. That search recently led me to start picking up some vintage boxing cards about two months ago, and I am loving it. Aside from baseball, boxing was America's most popular sport in the early 20th century. As a result, there are tons of amazing pre-war boxing cards of legends such as Jack Johnson, Joe Lewis, and John L. Sullivan that can be had for a fraction of the cost of pre-war baseball and football cards. Collecting these cards has given me that feeling again that I am adding pieces of history to my collection. It's also been fun learning more about great fighters like Sam Langford and Joe Gans that I previously knew very little about. All that to say, I agree that it's always possible and sometimes a ton of fun to switch things up a bit in your collecting. So I love this answer. And the reason I love this answer is it's basically reminding us to stay open-minded to change. It's saying, hey, I've always been a football collector, but I've really started to find some of these vintage boxing cards to be awesome. Now, my guess is if we were to ask this collector five years ago, did you see yourself collecting boxing cards? They would have probably said no. But now here we are, right? And if you are right now predominantly a baseball card collector, don't completely close off the opportunity and the option to look into other sports or even non-sports. You know, don't look now, but some of the, the best channels, in my opinion, um, on YouTube, you know, Ryan from Breakout Cards, um, Andrew from Nuff Said Cards, they are starting to really dabble in non-sport cards. And whether it be inventors or political figures or founding fathers. And, you know, I have the affinity for the pirate cards, mostly because I'm not obsessed with pirates, but I'm obsessed with the beauty of these cards. When you start looking at some of these cards that are, you know, 140 years old, and you hold them in your hand and you're like, this piece of paper, this piece of cardboard, was printed 145 years ago. I mean, that's pretty incredible. We're talking about, you know, I mean, I live in California. And California was founded in the 1840s. Some of these cards were printed on cardboard in the 1880s. 40 years after California became a state is when these cards started circulating. That's wild. And the history of it, but the beauty of the cards is unreal to me. So I take from this, consider not just skipping over some of the tables that have the things uh, that you previously hadn't really considered. Actually take your time and look at some of this stuff. Hold some of it. Ask to look at it. And I have a feeling that you, you might find yourself being more intrigued by some of these other issues than you previously thought that you were. 
to talk about boxing specifically, you know, in the 19, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, baseball was absolutely king of the world, at least king of the United States for sports fans. If you look just before that, some of the biggest guys out there, some of the biggest, most well-paid and and most famous people were boxers. You know, and the Jack Dempsey's, the John L. Sullivan's, the Jack Johnson's, those were big time guys. And it's kind of fun to collect things from an era where those people were the top of the heap. And I certainly appreciate the intrigue in boxing cards. I myself love vintage boxing cards as well. I don't have much in that regard. But I certainly am planning on acquiring some of it at some point. I'd just say stay open-minded to going a little outside of the lane that you're currently in. Because it might be like when Dorothy opens the door to Oz and everything hits color and you just go, wow. This is a whole new world that I am absolutely excited to participate in. Hey Greg, my baseball card hobby focus changes from year to year it seems. I started off as a Hall of Fame collector, only picking up one card of elite Hall of Fame players. Then I started doing player runs of Hall of Fame players. I soon realized that I didn't want or need every card of every Hall of Fame player. It was just too much inventory and some of the cards I don't even like. Then I started picking up cards that were more eye-appealing, so I collected the entire 34 to 36 Diamond Star set. I don't consider myself a set collector, but I do want to collect the most eye-appealing cards. In my opinion, there are maybe only three or four eye-appealing sets worth finishing. Then, two years ago, I started collecting non-sports cards and found that I really enjoy them. Last year, I learned how enjoyable post-playing day cards of Hall of Famers can be. This year, my focus is on quality over quantity. I've started selling off some cards that no longer fit into my collection. I've realized that what I want in my collection to look like long-term, and now I'm picking up cards that resemble that long-term goal. My long-term collection will consist of quality vintage baseball, vintage non-sport, and new shiny shiny modern cards of all-time greats. I finally feel like I've settled into a focused, long-term collector who is running a marathon rather than a race. Okay, now the first thing I'll say is Old Sarge Collects. He's a super good guy. Uh, He's got a super fun channel. I'm a subscriber of it. If you've not subscribed to his channel, I think that you'd enjoy it. Uh, consider doing that. Now, as far as what he has to say, there's a few things in there that I really like, but there's one thing that he mentions that I really wanted to focus on, and that's where he talks about the Diamond Star cards. He said, I want cards with the best eye appeal, and those Diamond Card Star, those Diamond Star cards are absolutely beautiful. At the end of the day, aren't cards really pieces of art? They're portable pieces of art. It's like a painting that instead of hanging on your wall, you hold it in your hand because it's small. That's, that's really a huge part of it. You know, it's very similar to art. And it is art. And when you look at the art, don't you want it to be attractive? Do you want to have the art because it's an artifact? Or do you want to have the art because it's an artifact and you enjoy looking at it? So I think there are times that some of us collect cards because we think we should collect the cards. You say, oh, I want the set or I want all of this player or I want all of this year or I want all of this team. And some of the cards you don't actually like the looks of. I I would say consider making sure that you're not just buying cards to have the card, 
Don't just buy a card and slab it up because it's part of a run that you need. What about buying the cards that you actually like to look at because these are actually pieces of artwork? And that's one of the reasons that I've gone away from a card that's sharp and off-center to a card that might be less sharp and show some patina and be centered because I enjoy looking at the centered copy more. Now, that's not to say that that's the right answer. Again, I'm not up here on a soapbox telling you my way is the right way. I'm just simply giving my response and my thoughts to what old Sarge Collect said here. And I love what he said here when he says, I want cards that look good. And that Diamond Star set is a beautiful set. It's an absolutely beautiful set. And that's my takeaway, is make sure you're buying cards that you like. Now, I have several Warren Spawn cards. I have, you know, a 52 Tops Warren Spawn. I have a 49 Leaf Warren Spawn. But one of the cards of Warren Spawn that I love is the 57 Tops Warren Spawn. I love the picture. I love the picture of the 57 Tops Don Drysdale. I love it. And that's the reason that I have that Warren Spawn. And that's the reason that I want the Don Drysdale is because I love the looks of the card. So one thing that I take away here that I think is a great suggestion and I, I totally respect him taking this shift in how he collects to instead of just collecting stuff, collecting the stuff that he finds to be the most visually appealing. Because at the end of the day, this is art. And we should like the way that it looks. Because what you do with this art is you look at it. So that makes perfect sense. Hi, Greg. This is my answer to what I have changed the most over the last year. I have literally tens of thousands of cards. I used to collect cards from all eras and of different sports. In the past year specifically, I have begun downsizing the vast collection, selling hundreds of items on eBay, mostly modern, and using that money to buy exclusively 50s to 70s Hall of Famer rookie baseball and football cards in mid-grades or in PSA or in SGC slabs. I found that I was all over the place with my collecting for decades. Now I am reducing inventory and focusing on getting the sought-after cards that I always wanted. I also feel this is a great time to grab those Hall of Famers in mid-grades at reasonable prices, especially football. I just wish I had thought of this strategy years ago. Live and learn. My buddy Billy Ballgame adds, Awesome video, Greg. Sorry I missed commenting last week. I would have loved to throw my two cents in on the SGC side. To answer this week's question, I think in the last year my focus has shifted even more toward rookie cards. You often refer to me and yourself as derelict collectors, because we collect many sports and a wide variety of cards, and you're right. But for me, if I could only buy one card per player, it would probably be their rookie card. My budget has changed over the last year as well, which allows me to now focus on some of the bigger rookie cards that I never thought I'd be able to afford. Great work, my friend. Keep it up. And finally... My collecting in the last year has changed in two ways. The first way is that I have focused more on centering than any other aspect. But larger thing that has changed is that I'm not pursuing rookie cards of Hall of Famers anymore. I'm trying to get my favorite card of a Hall of Famer so that I have more individual players and more money to buy cards. For example, the 1959 Topps Bob Gibson is awesome. And I'd love to have it, but I bought a really nice 1965 Bob Gibson that's one-tenth the cost of his rookie card. So now I can buy another Hall of Fame card that I like. 
Thanks for continuing to ask our thoughts. This, this is exactly why I love this. This is exactly why I love it. We have two comments, one from my buddy, Billy Ballgame, that's saying, I have been moving away from a lot of what I was collecting and doing, and I'm getting more and more focused on Hall of Fame rookie cards. And then we have another comment that says, I am getting out of Hall of Fame rookie cards, and I am buying my favorite card of those Hall of Famers, and then I could buy more cool cards of those players, and it's my favorite one of those players, instead of just having the rookie card, which I may or may not actually love. I mean, we have completely opposite counterpoints here, right? These are the opposite perspective. We have a couple of people saying, I'm getting into Hall of Fame rookie cards, and we have someone saying, I'm getting out of Hall of Fame rookie cards, and I'm getting into the cards of the players that I actually like the most. And you know who's actually right? All three of them. All three of them are right. Again, it's, it's like I was saying a moment ago. You've got to collect what you like to look at. And if, you know, if you like Stan Musial, but you don't like the 48 uh, Bowman Stan Musial rookie card, and you like the, the 52 Bowman uh, Stan Musial card more, then who's to say that buying the 52 Bowman instead of the 48 Bowman is a bad idea? It's your collection. It's your collection, and it's supposed to bring you joy. I mean, do you buy paintings on the wall that you don't like the looks of, but you think other people will like me? Like, oh man, that painting that I have on the wall is hideous but I bet other people will like it. So I'm going to buy it and I'm going to hang it and I'm going to stare at it all day. Like, why would anyone do that? You should buy things that you enjoy. Now, if you enjoy looking at the iconic rookie cards of different Hall of Famers, whether it's a cool picture that you think is a great picture or not, but you just love the iconic look of it, then that's what you should do. And if you're a person who says, no, I hate the rookie card for that guy, but I love the third card, then that's what you should do. Again, these are pieces of art. You wouldn't buy a bunch of art and hang it all over your house that you find absolutely awful just because other people think it's cool. You would buy art that you like and says something about your personality and your interests. And when you're flipping through them, you enjoy them. That's at least what I think. So with that said, here is my question for all of you for this week. You know, we've got the national coming up, as we've mentioned, and a lot of people out there have, uh, been saving a lot of money because just about any card that you can think of is going to probably be in the room. Now, not every card, but most cards will be there. So my question to all of you, whether you're going to the National or you're not going to the National, what is your ultimate grail card? What is the card that if you walked into the National with a pocket full of cash and you could bring it home and add it to your collection. What's the card? What's the card? I can tell you that mine has changed over the last several years. Years ago, I would have answered one way. The way I would answer that question right now, and it's out of my budget, so it's not going to happen this year, but it would be the 49 Leaf Jackie Robinson rookie card. That's the card that if I had, you know, ten to $15,000 walking into the National, that's the one I would want to bring home. That's my current Grail card. Now, a year from now, it might be different. What's yours right now if you were going to the National and you had a 
truckload of cash that you would bring home. I look forward to hearing what you all think, and I look forward to sharing your thoughts with everybody next week.